Good morning, Christ Church. Let's all stand as we commemorate this momentous day in the history of Christianity, where Jesus triumphantly entered Jerusalem and the crowd greeted him by shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, which is an entreaty for the Lord to save, save. And indeed, the coming of Jesus indicates that the Savior has come and he has come to deliver his people. And now we crown him with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords by giving to him all our praises, joining the crowds with our shouts of adoration and worship this morning. So let's sing out Hosanna. Oh, yeah. 
God be the glory. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Uh, the Bible said, I will enter His gate with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter His court with praise. For because our God is good and He is, His love endures forever. Good morning, people of God. Good morning. Everyone excited? Yes. Are you guys awake already? Yes. It's Palm Sunday. It's as Pastor said earlier. It's the triumphant entry of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in, Beth in Jerusalem. And we know that uh, it's not Resurrection Day yet, but we know that the history. We know that it's all uh, going to come to uh, pass this Sunday. Can't wait. But anyway, uh, let, we would like to welcome everyone to the gathering just people this morning. Let's welcome one another with the love of the Lord.
Please remain standing for the reading of God's Word this morning. Our text is found on Matthew 21, 9 and Zechariah 9, 9. And the multitudes going before him and those who followed after were crying out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in tri triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the pole of a donkey. This is the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord God, we are so uh, honored and humble this morning, Lord. Indeed, worthy, worthy, worthy are you, Lord, who is... Uh, King of kings and Lord of lords, Lord, how wonderful it is, Lord, to be in your presence this morning. Lord, you are beyond your beauty, Lord, your truth, Lord, your word is beyond comprehension, Lord, we are so glad and overflowing with joy and thanksgiving in our heart because of the significance of this, uh, your triumphant entry in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, Lord, that we, uh, Lord, people are crying, Hosanna, Hosanna. 
Glory is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. And Lord, we are just uh, so humble and privileged this morning, Lord, that Lord, we are once people without hope, without mercy, without, Lord, we were once your enemy, Lord, but uh, Lord, because of your great love, your mercy, Lord, you came to seek and to save that which are lost, and we are lost, and Lord, now we are found, Lord, you have given us hope and peace, Lord, because you came into the word, your word said that, Lord, you pour Christ, Lord, pour Christ, suffer once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, that he was, uh, Lord, he was put to death and made alive in the spirit, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for, Lord, that, for your word, that, uh, that uh, Lord, for really, Someone will die for a righteous person, but for a good person, perhaps someone would, might, might possibly dare to die, but you demonstrate your love for us that, one, that while we were still helpless and sinner, you came and you died for us, Lord. Lord, we are so, Lord, we rejoice this morning, Lord, for your uh, accomplishment at the cross at the Calvary 2,000 years ago. Hosanna, indeed, we sing this morning, Hosanna, Hosanna to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Save us, save us, Lord. And indeed, Lord, you came that through your life, your death and resurrection, Lord, now we, we have this, you have brought us into the, into the presence of God, Lord, where there is everlasting joy and peace forevermore, Lord. We thank you. Lord, this is the greatest thing in all the world, Lord, that to know that our sin is forgiven, that you will not, Lord, count our sin against us anymore. Lord, because you bore our sin on the cross. Lord, not, you died on the cross not because you're a sinner. You died because you bore our sin on the cross, Lord. And Lord, we are so, Lord, we are so happy. We are so blessed this morning. Lord, we, you said, Lord, that... If we don't worship you, Lord, you will cause the chairs around us and the curtain to sing praises to you, Lord. Lord, we, we are just uh, so thankful and honor and privileged, and we just want to give you all the praise and glory this morning because you are deserving, you are worthy, Lord. You are the lamb who was slain, and you are the king who conquered the graves, Lord. And Lord, we, this morning also we uh, come to you as one people of one a body of believers, Lord, we, Lord, we are needy people this morning. Lord, we, uh, we cast our, all our cares upon you, Lord, because you are our Heavenly Father who cares for us, Lord. So we thank you, Lord, for we know that in this life we will have trials and hardship and tribulation, but greater is he that is in us who is, than he who is in the world that because you have overcome the world, Lord, and uh, Lord, we thank you, Lord, and uh, Lord, we praise you now, and we pray for the preaching of your word this morning, that you will, your spirit will rest upon Pastor Joel, that we, we will not receive this as merely word of man, but word of the true living God, and Lord, that we will cause us, Lord, to have uh, faith and repentance and salvation to your people this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Good morning. And why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Indeed, Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem coronates Jesus as the king, the promised ruler from the seed of David, who would save Israel and who would rule over the nations in gladness. Not unlike America's Inauguration Day, where the rightful victor of an election is formally installed as the President of the United States with celebration and pageantry. So it is for, Christ or for Christians on Palm Sunday. This is our Inauguration Day. Jesus is crowned as King as He enters triumphantly into Jerusalem. Yet Jesus' coronation as the king defied the crowd's expectations. His crown was not made of gold, but of thorns. His victory is the humiliation of the cross. His kingdom is not of this world. Hence, the title to this morning's sermon is Coronation Defying Expectation. Coronation defying expectation. His inauguration, his installment as king would be far from what the people expected and believed to occur. That Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem is nothing short of his coronation as a ceremony to be king is apparent because the Gospel of Matthew explicitly interprets Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem as nothing less than the fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy. As we see in chapter 21, verse 2, the point of this morning is that Palm Sunday is Jesus' coronation ceremony. This is His inauguration day. In verse 2, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. So the Lord is the Lord over the donkey. This whole thing, Jesus riding on a donkey to enter Jerusalem, happened in order to fulfill what Zechariah foretold. But 500 years prior, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, and the foal of a beast of burden. The claiming of the donkey as the Lord, not just over the nation, but also the Lord over the donkey itself, is, without, is not without significance. Matthew states that the significance of Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem, with no mistake, Palm Sunday is Jesus' enthronement, His coronation as King, in fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy in chapter 9, verse 9 and following. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a young donkey, the foal of a female donkey. The command to, to rejoice is, is the response that God demands from Jerusalem in light of the promised arrival of the king from the seed of David. Zechariah, if you remember, is a contemporary of Haggai, which means that his prophecy took place after the exile already happened. Israel is no longer living in Judah. They're now in Babylon. God appears to have abandoned Israel. Or in the use of the language of the prophets, God divorced Israel. Or in the use of the language of Ezekiel and Jeremiah, the exile is when God killed His children Israel. And Rachel mourns because of the death of her kids. And now Israel is in mourning. The temple is destroyed. There's no Jerusalem. They're living in exile. 
And Zechariah approaches this nation of Israel in Babylon. Salvation is coming. Yes, judgment has come, but it is to form a remnant community, a people of God. And because salvation is coming, begin to rejoice. And you will know when salvation comes. Salvation will happen through the Messiah, the King. And there's one thing you got to look for when salvation comes. When the Savior comes, He will go to Jerusalem. And He'll be riding on a donkey. When you see that, shout, rejoice. Salvation is here. The Babylonian exile will be over. God will deliver you from all your oppressors. The Old Testament is is consistent with the description of the Messiah. And that is the Messiah must reign with righteousness. He must act to glorify God by trusting and obeying God's word, which we see in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 4. Here's another description of the king, the Messiah, from the seed of David, the one who's going to bring about salvation unto Israel, which will mean the salvation of the nations, so that the nations will be glad. In verse 4, but with righteousness. Same word. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. The rod of his mouth refers to the word of God. In other words, the way in which the Messiah will rule is by trusting and obeying the word of God. And this is righteousness. Trusting and obeying God's word is righteousness. And that is the hallmark of the Messiah. He will trust He will obey the word of God. Another description of the Messiah is that he will come from the tribe of Judah. And that he will command the obedience of the nations. And Jacob states this very thing right before he dies. In Genesis chapter 49 verse 10. The scepter. The scepter is that rod that signifies kingship. So it means the rule, the dominion shall not depart from Judah, where we get Jerusalem. To him shall be the obedience of the peoples. He ties his foal to the vine, and his donk is cold to the choice vine. Here in, his, in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, we have a very unexpected turn of events. The hero all along in the Genesis narrative among the 12 sons of Jacob is Joseph. One would expect that the obedience of the people, the kingdom through which all the nations will serve and rejoice, expectedly, if you're reading Genesis, you think it's going to come through Joseph. He's Jacob's favorite. He's already ruling in Egypt as a governor. And Jacob's about to die, and he does what his dad did for him. He pronounces blessing. The same blessing that Abraham received when he was about to depart for Canaan when he was living the land of Ur in Genesis 12. And so here it goes. He goes through every son lays hands on them, gives them their blessing. And surprisingly, he lays his hand upon Judah. And he says, through you, Judah, the nations will obey you. And the kingdom shall not depart from you. And this king from you, Judah, he will tie his donkey to the choicest vine, which means he will rule with humility. He will rule with kindness. 
this tradition then of kingship through Judah with humility in a donkey is the background to Zechariah 9, taken from Genesis 49. Not only is the promised king righteous, he is also victorious. Literally, the word there, victorious, is the word that we get, Hosanna. The righteous king from David is the Savior. The Savior, because that's what Hosanna means. Save. That is the king will save Israel from her enemies. In Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious. Or you can say the saving one. The one that does the Hosanna. The Yasav, the Savior. Humble and riding on the donkey. Genesis 49, we just read that. The obedience of the nations. The scepter shall not depart. He will rule by means of humility. Associated with the donkey. Verse 10. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea. And from the river to the ends of the earth. Once Israel is saved... The nations will also be saved. This is why when Paul begins his ministry, he starts where? In the synagogue. This is why when Jesus makes his parable, he says that the bread is not for the dogs, for the Gentiles, but the bread is for the sons and the family. That's why salvation must first come to Israel. Because once salvation comes to Israel, then the floodgates open. Salvation will come to the nations. As we see in Psalm 118, verse 25. O Lord, save. The same word for Hosanna. Blessed is he, the Savior, who comes in the name of the Lord from the house of the Lord, which is Jerusalem, Judah. We bless you. Salvation comes from Jerusalem. The location of salvation is in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, Israel and the nations will shout with praises and blessings to the King because the Messiah has come to save So Israel's entreaty or command, save Lord, save us. This command to the Lord, this entreaty will be answered by the Messiah. Save us Lord. What is God's answer? Here's my king, my son. He will come and he will save his people. There can be no mistake then that the arrival of Jesus to Jerusalem is nothing less than the coronation of Jesus as the king. Indeed, the crowd welcoming Jesus thought the very same thing. They thought, here is the king. Let's crown him. Let's recite Psalm 118 verse 25 because the promise of salvation has come. In in Matthew 21 verse 9, The crowd that went ahead of him and those that followed him shouted, Hosanna to the son of David, which means the Messiah, the King. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So the crowd's chant here was not sporadic. It was not a slogan made up on the spot. Indeed, the crowd's chant shows a level of sophistication and a deep knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures. The crowd recited almost verbatim Zechariah 9.9 and Psalm 118 verse 25. 
The crowd knew the Old Testament. They knew what to do once the Messiah comes to Jerusalem on a donkey. Recite Zechariah 9. Recite Psalm 118, verse 25. O Lord, save. Hosanna. Entreating, commanding God. Save us, Lord. Save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Who is coming in the name of the Lord? Well, Zechariah tells us, Behold, your king is coming to you. The seed of David, the promised one, he is coming on a donkey to Jerusalem. He's from the house of the Lord, from Jerusalem. And in response, we bless you. Blessed is Jesus, because he comes in the name of the Lord. When Zechariah says, here is your king. The psalmist says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The crowd, when they saw Jesus riding on the donkey, put the two together and they recite both Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's his coronation ceremony. Finally, we get our king. He is here. Yet Jesus' coronation defied the crowd's expectation. Israel's oppressor is not Rome, but sin and death. Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. His crown is a crown of thorns. He will command the obedience of the nations not by overthrowing Rome, but by conquering our evil, unbelieving hearts. And we know this because Jesus, upon entering Jerusalem, did not stay to claim His throne. Upon entering and upon casting out the merchants in the temple, what did Jesus do? He didn't stay there for the week. He left. He left. And this is significant because it confused. It startled. It perplexed the crowd. What are you? We just said you're the king. Why are you leaving Jerusalem? You're supposed to rule in Jerusalem. So we see in Matthew 21, verse 17, And he left them, and he went out of the city of Jerusalem. He didn't stay in Jerusalem. He went to Bethany. He went to Bethany. And there he lodged. Defying expectation, Jesus left Jerusalem on a Sunday only to return on a Friday to be killed on the cross. As we see in Matthew 23, verse 37, as Jesus returns to Jerusalem, he knows what will happen in Jerusalem. He must die. O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and the stones and stones those who are sent to it. Jerusalem, to be sure, is the location of the Messiah's coronation, but it is also the place where the king will be executed. The Messiah will be murdered in Jerusalem. Ironically, his execution is, is his coronation. His crown is the crown of thorns in Matthew 27, verse 29. And after weaving a crown of thorns, they put it on his head. And a reed in his right hand, they kneeled down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, 
the Messiah, right? The king of the Jews, the king from the seed of David. Here he is, dying, bleeding, gasping for air, wearing a crown of thorns. Nail between his hands and his feet. Jesus is crowned, all right. He's crowned in humiliation. He's crowned in shame with the thorns. So the shouts of Hosanna. Hosanna on Palm Sunday is met with a shout of crucify him on Good Friday. Chapter 27, verse 23. And he said, why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. The irony, of course, is that the crowds chant, crucify him on Good Friday is the answer to their plea on Palm Sunday. Save us, Lord! Hosanna! Save! 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 And they answer their own question. How will he save? Crucify! Crucify! Crucify him! Matthew 21, verse 9, the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna, save us! Save us! How will he save? How will he save? Well, they answered their own question. Crucify him. Crucify him. On the cross, the true enemy is defeated. On the cross, sin is defeated. Jesus offered the perfect sacrifice for our sins. On the cross, God reconciles us to himself. On the cross, death will finally die. On the cross, salvation comes. Not from Babylon, not from Rome, but from sin and death. The true enemy, not just of Israel, but all the nations. The ironic answer to the plea on Palm Sunday is given on Good Friday. Crucify him. That's how the Lord saves through the cross with humility and shame. Now let us close with the following challenge. Palm Sunday indeed commemorates Jesus' Jesus' coronation as the rightful king who will save Israel and bring gladness to the nations. Yet the joyous plea of Hosanna, Messiah save us, King save us, at Jesus' coronation of Palm Sunday is answered unexpectedly by the hateful demands of crucify him on Good Friday. Jesus is king by obeying the Father's word to die on the cross. Remember what is the hallmark of the king, the Messiah. He's righteous. What does it mean to be righteous? You trust and you obey the word of God. If you obey the Father by going to the cross as the offering for sin, and sin is the true enemy of Israel, it is the true enemy of every nation, the true enemy of all humanity. Therefore, let us shout, Hosanna, this morning. Save! Save, Lord. How does the Lord save? By shouting, crucify him. 
by looking to the cross, perplexingly, unexpectedly, in awe, wonder, and worship. Really? This is how we get saved? Really, this is the answer to Zechariah, the cross? This is the answer to the psalmist? Blessed is you who comes in the name of the Lord? Public execution? That's why Paul says, the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, what is the cross? It is the power of God. So how do we answer Hosanna? By looking to the cross in awe, wonder, and worship. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Lord, much like the crowd, perhaps some this morning still can't get over the reality that you would rule by dying. That your coronation is achieved by means of public execution. The crucifixion of your very own son. But it must be this way. Because the enemy is not Rome, it's not Babylon. It's not poverty, it's not cancer. It's not social injustices. The enemy is sin and death. And the only way to defeat sin and death is through a perfect sacrifice for sin. <laughs> and so we stand in awe. And wonder at the cross. Lord, that you would save us. By taking on our sins. And we worship you. And we cry out, blessed is he. Who has come in the name of the Lord. And he came on a donkey and died on our behalf. And how worthy are you, Lord, of all praises and adoration. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand and worship the Lord.